Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Future Focus Finance Inclusion Event 2021. Um, you are joining us today for a, uh, a packed afternoon of uh, sessions and speakers. We have um, a lot of great speakers lined up for you. The first thing is our uh, Inclusion and Diversity Resource Pack. Uh, so we are really pleased to announce today that we are launching the Inclusion and Diversity Resource Pack. Um, you will find a link to it in the reception area of the platform that we're using today. If you can't find it there or want to access it when you're back at work um, tomorrow or next week, uh, you can find it all on the FFF website under the diversity pages. FFF have done a lot of work on inclusion and diversity over the last uh, couple of years. And one of the most common things that, that, that the team get asked is, you know, where, where, do, where do I start? What can I do? What, what should my organisation, what should my team be doing? What are the real practical things um, that will make a, a difference to the diversity and inclusion agenda? So this resource pack um, is, is, is a step towards uh, you know, the, the real practical examples, uh, real life case studies um, of what people have tried and what's worked well um, for you to share with your teams and for you to think about. So you can see some examples there of the sorts of things that are included in the um, pack uh, where we, we've got the checklist, we've got examples of good practice, um, links to resources, about the sorts of things that, uh, that the people should be looking at. Um, and it's over a whole host of uh, different subjects and areas. So creating a diverse workforce, maintaining an inclusive environment, demonstrating inclusive leadership and training and development ideas. So please download it yourselves today, share it with your teams, share it with your, um, your line managers um, and let's start uh, using this and uh, making a big impact on, on this agenda. Um, we're also, as part of this resource pack, um, looking to highlight the towards, towards Excellence accreditation process that is being rolled out, um, which is a three level process of accreditation for teams that are doing really well on this agenda um, can evidence and demonstrate that they take diversity and inclusion um, seriously and uh, are, are becoming the role model employers and uh, organisations that we want to see replicated throughout the NHS. So um, uh, big, big sell for that. Please share it widely. We're going to be tweeting a lot about it um, and we want it to be as highly visible as possible. I don't think I need to explain why it's so important. Everyone here today obviously realises the importance of the agenda, which is why you've signed up for the day, um, which is fantastic. But just to, to remind us, this is um, crucially important. It has been it stated within the, the people plan just how important it is that we make um, inclusivity and diversity a key part of everything that we do. Um, and again, preaching to the converted, I know, but it is really important for our staff, our patients and the future of, of the NHS that we uh, push forward this agenda. And it is for every single finance team to play a part in. Um, the first start, the first step, as it were, towards, um, towards taking that journey is to recognise that inequalities do exist. Um, they exist in, in, in most aspects of life um, and that includes NHS finance we well, we accept that they are unacceptable and we accept that we need to make a change and uh, resources like this uh, hopefully will help people to take those practical first steps the number of people when I've had the conversation with them about why the agenda is so important say but what what do I do how can I how can I make a difference when it's it's an area that I'm only just starting to understand? Um, so having the practical examples there um, uh, are, it will be really helpful. So first off, we have with us uh, Maria Wheeler, who is the Chief Finance Officer for Thurrock CCG, um, and Hayley Ringrose, who is a former NHS Chief Financial Analyst and Speaker. 
uh, who are going to talk to us about their personal perspectives. So I was asked to um, speak today um, about, you know, my experiences, um, and how I found um, um, being transgender in, in the NHS. Um, I guess really I wanted to sort of just say a little bit about uh, when I decided to uh, transition, um, one of the greatest fears that, that you have um, is that you won't be accepted, um, and particularly at work. I mean, your friends and family first, I guess, and then at work. Um, I was a contractor at the time, so I worried about the fact that, you know, uh, people really didn't have to be uh, openly uh, discriminatory. Um, they could just say, oh, no thanks, you know, move on. So I was particularly concerned about that. Um, I decided, I took a contract in West Norfolk and I decided that I would, uh, at the next contract, I would definitely transition. I'd already made the decision I was going to anyway. Um, and um, I, I made a mistake um, and sent uh, my boss uh, a text, which wasn't actually due to go to him. And uh, I ended up um, talking to him about it and he was enormously um, supportive, John Webster. Um, I was going for the uh, permanent CFO role at the time um, and he said he was more than happy to support me um, when um, uh, if I got the got the role um, in transitioning. Unfortunately I didn't get the role, um, I absolutely gutted, I really wanted to work there um, but uh, I was then introduced to Mandy Ansell of Thorox CCG which I've just left actually so just a bit of an update. Uh, so I'll be joining uh, Hearts Partnership Trust soon. But anyway, um, yeah, Mandy Ansel, um, and again, she was brilliantly supportive. If anything, I'd go further and say that she uh, felt honoured that I was transitioning. Uh, that would be my first role. Um, and uh, and she was excellent. She went uh, beyond the uh, call of duty. She interviewed all the staff, let them all know before I got there. Um, so when I got there and walked in, I was expecting double takes and all sorts of things. Uh, fear in my head, if you know what I mean, people feeling awkward, but actually people were amazingly supportive. And I would say if you're going to transition um, and you are a transgender person looking to do that, then the NHS is a very good employer for doing that. Um, and, it, and it's been the case, I think, um, before I started, I just want to be treated like any other female employee. Um, and um, and I largely have been good and bad, I guess. Um, so that's, that's the positive side of it. Um, I think with anything like this, you, you don't go through it without a uh, degree of um, uh, negativity um, to it. And my main area uh, was uh, the use of pronouns or the wrong use of pronouns. Um, and so I, um, quite obviously in my head, uh, perhaps not for everyone, uh, I like to be called she and her or referred to as those, um, whereas, and certainly not he and him. Um, but it's amazing since I've uh, been the last two and a half years, probably well over a dozen times, uh, people have used the incorrect pronouns. Um, and I had to just sort of make you aware, really, of, of the impact um, that, that had on me, um, uh, more than I probably anticipated, uh, to be honest. Um, as you probably gather, I do my absolute utmost, I know my voice is, but I do my utmost to, to look female. Um, I've got the makeup, I've got the albinish, I've got everything, try and do everything I can. Um, and whether I always succeed or whether I have a few uh, wardrobe malfunctions from time to time, um, I think it's fairly obvious what I'm trying to be. Um, so when someone calls you he or him or refers to you as that, um, it almost makes you feel like it's not well, you know, it's not worth bothering. Why, why am I bothering? I might as well just wear a shirt, a shirt and tie um, and not bother with all of this stuff. And so it's absolutely uh, so important. Um, I mean, on the flip side of that, of course, um, majority of people, I'm pleased to say, use the right pronouns. And when they do, it really warms me. Um, it, whereas one side of it is you feel excluded uh, when the wrong ones are used, um, and you are, um, um, you, you say, not accepted at all. Um, whereas when you're the, the right ones are used, you feel included, you feel part of the, the team, and you feel accepted for who you are. And that's so 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 important. So I would always urge anyone to, uh, you know, I think if you're in doubt, you ask the question. I guess really, um, and I know I've probably. I may have got over my time, I didn't quite check the time I came on, but um, essentially I suppose I would I would end really by by the, the phrase really in my head is that whether, um, and I still don't know that, jury's out, I suppose, whether um, I'm tolerated uh, or people from minor, uh, minority groups are tolerated or are they truly accepted? And I suppose the jury's still out on that one and probably something that we uh, perhaps would, would talk about as the, in the, the course of the afternoon. 
Um, but I say last year overall, um, a very positive experience. So, um, so it's a plus, I'll finish on a plus anyway, uh, but perhaps with more work to do. Um, and I'll leave it there. So over to you, Hayley. Thank you, Maria. I hope I'm on screen now. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Maria, sorry, was amazing. And that's a reason to this year. more of a lifetime story. And when I was asked to speak just for five minutes today, I was really concerned because I usually speak very slowly for the first five minutes. And I don't get into the key messages. So it gives the audience time to tune into this voice you've already heard. Sorry, no time for that today, so hold on tight. But I was thinking about how I have consciously and unconsciously adapted and compensated for others throughout my career because I am different. And I think that ties in with Maria's final comments, that tolerance and acceptance. For a lot of my career, I behave like I had to be better than my bit to be accepted and good enough. But maybe that was me unconsciously assuming their tolerance rather than their acceptance. I have a very obvious disability. I was born with cerebral palsy. It affects my balance and coordination. But the thing is, in fact, it certainly my speech. Bit of a problem for a talking to introvert. Also, in the days of virtual conferencing, a virtual impact, it feels even greater. So, my background is I worked in energy and finance for over 26 years, starting on the regional graduate training scheme. And my career spanned eight roles across six organisations mainly at senior management level. My final role, and the one I'm probably more proud of, was leading the costing team at Stockport Foundation Club for 11 years. The reality is that my successful career path was achieved based on my ability regardless of the terrible body. I never tip the disability box on application box, which is the only part of the equality part that is not completely anonymous, rightly so due to the guaranteed interview scheme, but you have the excuses. But I wanted to be shortlisted and recruited based on my skills and experience. If I apply for jobs that have not been successful, it's because they've been a better candidate for that role. Equally, I'm pretty sure I've never been offered a job just because I have the diversity quotas. I hope not. Diversity is about creating a level playing field. My speech impediment only held me back until I stopped letting it. In the early days, I tried to fit more into back office roles, but I'm an extrovert. And I'm that more naturally drawn to financial management and to costing. Outward focus roles that needed excellent communication and persuasion skills. 
communication is about how you engage and the word you use. It's not about your accent or any other defect in your speech. And if I had more time, I'd tell you the story of how I became an inspirational speaker. And much to my shock and everybody else's. Physically, there are times when I need a bit of extra help or provision. Days like today when we've got snow, ice, no terrible party, not a good mix. And in the workplace, everything I need help with. And there are laws to ensure that the big things are covered, the accessibility into buildings. But I find in general it's the small things and in general colleagues are very accepting and willing to help. But they might not want to offer unsolicited help for fear of offending. So I worked, I needed to be prepared to tell how they could support me. I didn't have a hot drink at work for the first five years of my career because I thought my colleague wouldn't like the fact I couldn't take my turn on the tea run. And often it's the small things like that that make a big difference. Like Maria, I've been working that my experience is mainly positive. I don't feel I've been overtly discriminated against, but I know that's not the case for many people. And probably a lot of you on the call today have a different experience. But that's why it's so important that people like me and you are happy to talk about our experiences. And why I'm delighted to see nearly 200 people on the call today. Although that's quite terrifying. Maybe I'm quite glad I can't physically see you. So, it's all our job to shout out against discrimination and to work towards equality. But the best way to promote diversity is to live it out. I want to end with one of my favourite quotes from the Charlie Mackenzie cartoons. Sorry, I've not got time to put it on screen, but go and Google it after. Even better, link it with me on LinkedIn and there's a picture there. So this is the horse, the boy, blah, blah, blah. And in this particular cartoon, the horse asks the boy what his greatest discovery is. The boys reply, I am enough. So my final quote to you is, you are enough. Thank you. Thank you, uh, both Maria and Hayley. That was uh, very inspirational and very brave of both of you to, to come on. Um, I recognise what you said there, Hayley, about how disconcerting it is when you're talking to the computer, knowing that there's 200 people out there uh, listening to you. So, so thank you for, uh, for for being brave and doing that for us. Um, there are a couple of subjects that I think it'd be really good for us to have a bit of a conversation around. The first one is is you both mentioned this um, this this issue, well, issue or um, concept of tolerance or acceptance where do you think we really are on that 
And how do you think we might start to try and move the dial on that? Um, Maria, I'll come to you first and then you, Hayley. Almost did it. Um, yes, uh, I think I, I think we're probably uh, on the move. I guess I, I would still say probably more on tolerance than acceptance, but um, I think it's it's gradually it's gradually getting that way. Um, I think from um, being transgender, we, we, it's, it's quite a, a new thing for people. I think, and although we've been around for you know years and years and years, it's probably becoming more visible now than it ever used to be. Um, so I think uh, I think it's um, you know people know I exist and uh, people like me exist, um, but whether people do truly accept, uh, I, I don't know yet. That's probably been unfair because there's probably an awful lot of people that uh, that do fully accept, but it just um, I just I just don't know. Um, and I think uh, I think we also the, the other bit I was going to say was the fact the fear of uh, offence, and I know that um, Hayley mentioned that. Um, then people talk to you, they're, they're very careful about what they say because they don't want to offend you type thing. Um, so I, that, that is also, I think, a sign of, of a lack of acceptance as well. So I think we're, we're, um, we're on the move and certainly events like this will certainly help. Um, but I think, again, Hayley, sorry, I'm picking up your bits because your, your speech is so much better than mine. <laughs> um, uh, but also, you know, the... Um, uh, I was going to say, so I lost a train of thought there. For a second. Yeah. I mean, you know... We're definitely on the uh, on the move anyway. So I'll leave it there. <laughs> I'll collect my thoughts in a minute. <laughs> Thanks, Maria. Hayley? Well, for me, I think we're getting really... I, my experience in all these NHS finance, um, and I think we are groundbreaking on this. I think the work that FFF is doing to support the wider finance function in understanding diversity is beyond even what I see in other parts of the NHS. So I think we should applaud ourselves for afternoons like this and for the material that's available. Nationally, we've got a long way to go. Um, my view is what I said before at other conferences. I'd love to be at a stage where we don't have conferences like this because we don't need to because it's not an issue. But I think we're decades away from that. So I think we've just got to keep doing trailblazing what we do it would have been that i gave what work to be a speaker now doing that in a pandemic wasn't my greatest move but it's about saying maybe you've got a story to share i've got a story to share a lot of you were saying it again you've got a story to share but not everybody wants to, but we need to educate. And if I'm prepared to do that, it's taking those small boxes one at a time. Thanks, Hayley. On that concept of, you know, sharing our stories and, and being visible, um, we don't have many visible directors, senior leaders from either LGBTQ plus communities or disability disability groups. Why do you think that is? Um, and what what should we be thinking about? You know, are, are we are we closing ourselves off, or are we making it not feel safe for people to be open and honest? Who wants to go first? Maria, come to it's you. A, um, I think it's a bit of both. Um, I think people. Um, uh, I'm concerned anyway. Um, I, I don't. I don't actually aware of, of anybody who is a transgender at the moment within the NHS. I'm sure there is loads, um, but I'm not aware of any. Certainly in my my sort of area, um, and uh, and it worries me that there is transgender people that they're worried about coming out. You know, and that's a that's a massive fear. 
Um, I think uh, the, the the rest of the LGBT, the gay community, I suppose, um, have been more visible for longer. But still, I I worry that there's they don't feel safe in coming out, and I think that's important. Um, I did a workshop about six months ago, and we sort of touched on this, and there was there's still quite a few examples where people were openly discriminated against um, from from the LGBT community. Um, I personally haven't really experienced that as such. I know I mentioned a bit of negativity as far as I'm concerned, but so I think I, I worry that um, that that's part of it. Um, and I think there's there is still an issue, and I think probably most people would see this is that you're you tend to uh, is it sort of, I don't know it's human nature I suppose is to uh, employ someone similar to yourself. I think that's a uh, in quite quite a number of sort of areas, um, and therefore they um, they won't employ somebody perhaps from the LGBT community because of whatever reason. So I think there is a there is a worry a fear in my mind uh, anyway that. That's potentially the reason. So two two areas really. Thanks, Maria. And I mean, just on the LGBTQ community bit, I suppose the bit for me that I think we really need to understand is that is there indifference between the NHS finance community and the rest of the NHS? Because if you look at chief execs, for example, you have lots of visible openly gay, for example, chief execs. <clears throat> Sorry, it's my voice going. Um, but we don't we see less of that in finance. So. I'm really personally keen to understand if we are putting up artificial barriers or if there is some sort of cultural issues that we need to address. But I'm going to come to Hayley now because we're running out of time and we need to get to our next session, So, I think one thing I did want to pick on, somebody mentioned it in the chat, is we don't actually know because I have a very obvious disability. But there will be lots of people out there with hidden disabilities, they with OGBT. So it's about people having confidence to put their hand up for the as I am background. I think from disability perspective, probably is a bit of a glass ceiling that is going to take time to break through. But um, disability in general is, you know, I, I worked in the NHS 26 years and I've seen massive change in that time in recruitment practices, in accessibility, running through schools, university into employment. Uh, Paralympic in 2012 gave us a massive leap forward. So you are seeing more people coming up through the ranks, but there's a natural lead time as well. Thank you both. Um, so we've overrun on our session. Uh, which is a shame because there are lots of questions that we still need to talk about some really big important topics i think the takeaways from me for from this session is uh, a you're you're both amazing and inspirational speaker so thank you b i think we do need to think about recruitment processes and how we adopt and adapt them i don't know but clearly and it's coming through in some of the comments um we need we need to think about how we approach recruitment um and see it's the, it's the cultural thing isn't it this 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 tolerance versus acceptance i mean i found it really uncomfortable um hearing you talk about feeling tolerated um because that is just not on a, on a purely human level that is not something you want to hear um colleagues from within the finance family say so thank you both for being so open and honest with us um I'm sure we will be having further conversations in other forums because this is a big, important topic that we need to uh, continue being open um, about. So thank you both very much. Um, I'm now thank going you. to move on to our next session of the day. Um, and we are joined by Mark Johns, who is the Engagement, Diversity and Inclusion Manager for the Northeast Ambulance Service NHS Trust, uh, Foundation Trust even. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Mark. Thank you for joining us. Um, and I think you're going to talk to us about your anti-racism anti journey. Thank you very much for that introduction and thanks for inviting me along today. 
Um, I'll use the term minority ethnic to describe people who identify with some people prefer a range of other terms such as people of colour, ethnic minorities, black, Asian, or reference to um, a country of heritage or birth. There's a huge debate going on at the moment. So apologies if I cause any offence. My event, my advice to others would just be, if you get it wrong, apologise, adjust how you refer to people and, and move on. Um, as, you, as you'll know, um, black age minority ethnic communities have been greatly affected by events uh, over the last year, such as the murder of George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, uh, the increased risk of COVID-19, and we're seeing challenges with the take up of vaccines. And the, this has put increasing pressure on the NHS services to deal with it and take action. So uh, what is racism? Before we sort of go into what we've done, I just thought I'd, I'd recap on this. So racism isn't new, it's been happening for centuries. It can occur between individuals, be directed at uh, individuals or groups. It can be systematic, it can be individual, and it can occur within and outside organisations. Sometimes it's intended, sometimes it's not. Um, and it can often happen when we don't have due regard or consideration for, for other people. So throughout Western history, there's been many examples of racially motivated atrocities committed by European people. And I'll find this a, a particularly interesting fact. Uh, so this, fa this is two maps of the world. One you'll be quite familiar with on the uh, left-hand side of your screen, and one you might be less familiar with on the right-hand side of the screen. The one on the left puts Europe in the center of the world, amplifies its size and prominence, and the maps used in many schools today. Um, the other map um, was, uh, was first brought out in, uh, late, in the mid 1800s and is a much more proportional map of the world and represents the true size of each country relative to each other. And it wasn't until the 1970s when Arnold Peters sort of brought this out, but obviously it gives a very different view of the world. And one of the reasons it said that this was introduced was um, often to show Europe and, uh, and the UK at the center of the world, um, because often Europe had the power, money and, and control. But just an interesting fact for you. So what I'm going to try to do very quickly is take you on a, an, on a quick whistle stop tour on our journey of race equality over the last 12 months. So many of you that are familiar with uh, the NHS and how race equality has developed will, will be familiar with the Workforce Race Equality Standard. Uh, it was introduced in 2016 and we signed up to it about five years ago. Uh, so although we've been working on this for five years, you can see some areas have had uh, greater progress than others. You know, our workforce profile is still relatively small within the Northeast. There's about 5% of our population are Black, Asian and minority ethnic, but only 1.5% of our workforce. But we are making progress. Uh, we've seen our recruitment processes improve massively. Um, in 2016, you were 1.6 times more likely to be appointment, appointed if you were white compared to if you were Black. And uh, more recently, that we've got that down to you're just as likely to be appointed if you're white compared to if you're black. So I think one of the things that we've been, uh, it's been really helpful for our organisation is that senior leadership and commitment. Um, so our CEO has made sure we put in, uh, a range of messages on out to our organisation on race equality. Here's just a couple, um, but it's really important that we have senior uh, leadership buy-in, commitment, and that we continue to drip feed those messages and that support for race equality. Um, where I'm really lucky to work in an organisation that's got that commitment. And um, as you can see there, it's not just something we roll out once a year. It's something that our chief uh, um, comments on very frequently. Uh, one of the things we've done, like many organisations over the last 12 months, is to look at uh, creating a safe space for people uh, to talk about how um, recent events or past events have impacted on them and make sure we do that in a safe environment where people, um, it, it, so that it's confidential and people can really share. 
Uh, we're still early days, but we've had three sessions so far and we're starting to build a trust and a relationship with colleagues that haven't engaged with us before so we can explore some of the uh, some of their challenges and identify uh, what we can do. One of the things that's been really useful for us is our um, staff network. So we have a, a staff network called Together at NAS for our Black, Asian, Minority, Ethnic staff. Uh, recently appointed a new chair. The membership is growing and they started to reach out into the organisation, help us to uh, get more people on board, but also share stories both locally and nationally about um, what um, people from various communities, how they've um, supported the diversity agenda over the years and also helped us um, develop our approach to improving um, our work for our patients, but also for our workforce. I think with, an, with all of our work on race equality, as well as equality in general, it's been really important to recognise and celebrate the achievements, not just the really big things, but also some of the smaller things. So at our annual um, celebration awards, our T awards, uh, we made sure that all of our staff network chairs were recognised for the crucial role that they have played on equality over the last um, 12 months and longer. I think it's also important that you look for external recognition. Um, so we've done a, a couple of events, a, a, a recruitment event focusing on black and Asian people, and also a community uh, ambassadors project where we recruited and trained a number of ambassadors in the local community to reach out into their communities and talk about how to use our services, when to use our services, promote ourselves as an employer of choice, and um, also just help to dispel some of the myths. Um, we've used a bit like the framework you mentioned at the very start there, the finance framework, we've used something called ENAI um, to help uh, just benchmark ourselves against other organizations and drive forward some of that improvement around equality. Um, as an organization that's got few uh, black, Asian, minority, ethnic people, um, we, we, we didn't have a huge image bank. So when we were putting social media posts out, when we were developing literature and information, uh, we didn't always have images that represented the workforce. We are and we want to be. Um, so fortunately, our staff network members came forward and we uh, worked with our comms team to get a, a range of images across all of our service areas both frontline and also some back office services so we could try to share more representative images so when people look at the northeast ambulance service um, they can see people that look like them and represent them we've also done a lot of work around and um, trying to develop our own resources and link to other resources that are out there um, we've we've on the back of the george floyd murder and black lives matters we had a, a number of people share their lived experience what it was like working for the ambulance service both now and many years ago and just try to challenge some of the um uh, some of their understanding about their own privilege what they can do how they can be better white allies the impact of racism uh, etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think developing re resources and linking people to resources that are already out there have been really useful in supporting us to drip feed messages and and just challenge people and help them understand. Having dedicated uh, people within the organisation is a must. Um, this work shouldn't be an add-on to somebody else's job. Uh, so we've got an ADI advisor, we've got a positive action officer working on this agenda alongside me. Um, they bring a range of experience. Uh, sometimes other organisations uh, tag this onto an HR advisor role. Um, but and often forget about the patient element to diversity and inclusion. Uh, it's important that we cover not just um, the workforce issues, but areas around um, making sure our services are accessible uh, to patients that we manage our um, external profile and visibility. Some of the campaigns and activities that we've um, developed are around trying to improve awareness around uh, Black History Month and other key dates in the calendar. So we've used um, national resources, but also showcased a number of uh, individuals within the trust so that we can continue to, to, to educate and increase the profile. As I've said before, drip feeding this uh, information about race equality has been really important for us to push this agenda uh, across the year.
we've done a big campaign over the last um, six months around creating allies. So that might be white allies, it might be heterosexual allies, it might be non-disabled allies. But um, sometimes as allies, we're in a really good position to be able to help and support this agenda. Um, so we've worked with somebody nationally called uh, Sharon from the Power of Staff Networks to really help deliver a program of allyship mentoring um, to our uh, colleagues in the organization. And uh, we've managed to recruit over uh, 100 allies who have got involved, who are now involved in uh, staff network activities and other events to try and support our wider work on diversity and inclusion. Uh, we've borrowed this with pride from Sussex uh, Community NHS Foundation Trust, um, but forms the sort of basis of, of, of some of our work around our white allyship and touches on some of the things people can do to be a better ally. So it might be something you, you, you want to consider as you're developing work within your own organisations. So it's I've, I've touched on already the importance of trying to celebrate diversity and inclusion within the organisation, push messages and share people's experiences. And we've heard two uh, great personal accounts of lived experiences from Maria and Haley. Um, already, but it's really important that we try to amplify the voice of other peoples and help improve that understanding. And we've used things like National Inclusion Week and on the next slide, um, Hate Crime Awareness Week to try and, and push those messages out and, and talk about the, uh, the impact of uh, diversity and inclusion on individuals. Uh, Hate Crime Awareness Week was, a, was another week where we pushed stories. Uh, we developed our, uh, some content for our staff about being you is not a crime, but targeting people is. We've asked people to report issues through to, on uh, internal risk monitoring procedures so that um, we can uh, make sure that our staff are safe, so that when there's hate incidents that are staff on staff, they're reported where there is a patient that abuses a staff for whatever reason, then that's reported and followed up. But also when people go out um, and support individuals that have been victims of crime or, or receiving treatment because they've been a, a victim of a hate crime that they know where to go to and how to get uh, help and su uh, support. We've recruited 48 hate crime champions so far and uh, 19 have received uh, the new accredited training and we've done that in partnership with Northumbria Police and a local council. Uh, they've been really supportive in um, helping to roll out a campaign of hate crime, that create crime champions across the northeast. And, uh, and we were really keen to get on board with that. So another day, um, Wear Red Day. It's a national day against um, racism. And you can see here a number of organisations sharing information on workplace, on social media, um, on Facebook and Twitter and other platforms, just saying that they support um, our approach to, to race equality and are against racism. So we've got here our chief executive, deputy uh, chief executive, our HR director, um, our director of quality and safety, comms managers and, and, and other individuals in the trust all visibly showing their support by, by wearing red on, on this particular day. So we, we, we're starting to do some work on microaggressions. So for those that aren't aware of what microaggressions are, they're, they're often the small comments or remarks that people make to other people. Um, they can be one-offs, but all often happen multiple times a day or multiple times a week. And for some, they can they can appear small or trivial, but for those people it happens to, um, they can have a real profound impact. Um, the compounded efforts of those comments and remark on faith, religion, etc., um, they have um, a, an effect which, which people refer to as weathering. And when you're when you're um, uh, when they impact on you every day, it can have a huge effect. Uh, but don't just take my word for it. There's a, there's a video coming up in just a second. Um, and there's a woman called Lily Singh who provides a great short clip on, on what microaggressions can look like. So I'll leave this with you for a moment.
A lot of people ask me if I've ever suffered any extreme cases of racism, and to be honest, no. I'm fortunate enough to say that I haven't. But since moving to LA, I have definitely had some people say some ridiculous things to me. Here are real things that white people have said to me. My dad's name is Sukwinder. Sukwinder. Sukwander. I'll just call your dad Sam. Oh my god, you're Indian? I loved Slumdog Millionaire. So your last name's Singh. Are you related to Ranveer Singh? You know, one of my coworkers is Indian. What a small world. So I went to like an Indian wedding once and I wore the full costume and everything. Your parents must be really strict. Did they expect you to get married at 23? I even belly danced to Bollywood music and I wore that little dot on my forehead. So why aren't you a doctor or a lawyer? Are you allowed to have a boyfriend? I went to a little India once and I got the best tandoori chicken. Do you speak Indian at home? Are you a very strict Hindi? So is your real name Lily? Stop lying. I've never met a real Indian Lily. Do you know Priyanka Chopra? She's Indian too, right? It's so terrible. Everything you see in movies about India. You probably want something spicy, right? You look so exotic. I thought you were from Brazil or something. You know, I've always wanted to visit Delhi. My friend went to India last year. It changed his life. So where are your parents from? Uh, they're from Punjab. Oh, uh, that's in the Middle East, right? I will take the veggie burger. Is that because you're Islam? Do you have to get an arranged marriage? Did you experience like a lot of racism growing up? So you're not allowed to have sex before marriage, right? That's crazy. Here's the thing though, right? I don't believe that every person who says something ignorant is trying to offend me. I think maybe they just don't know any better and no one has schooled them. So this is my attempt to make you understand. Here's what the reverse would sound like. If I spoke to white people, how they spoke to me. Yeah, my dad's name is Peter. Patar? Patar. <laughs> I'll just call him Brub Joth. Wait, are you white? Oh my god, I love Taylor Swift. Wait, wait, Smith? Are you related to Derek Smith? He's also from America. Oh my god. The girl who served me a latte at Starbucks this morning was also white. So I totally get you. I went to a white wedding once. Oh, beautiful, but it was so short. And your families are so tiny. Wait, so do you speak fluent American at home? Or British? Or Scottish? Irish. I even did the chicken dance and wore a tie around my forehead. So cultured. Wait, so you're not a country singer? Are you allowed to be a virgin? Ooh, I went to Burger King once and I loved it. So is your real name Sarah? Yeah. Oh my God, I know like nine white Sarahs. <laughs> my friend went to Ohio last year and he said his life was exactly the same. And you're from Chicago, right? Mm-hmm. That's in Europe, right? Um. I'll take the steak and potatoes. Is that because you're Christianity? So will your parents like force you to fall in love or are you allowed to get arranged? So did they like expect you to be pregnant by 16? Do you mind? Can I... Wow, that is so soft. Is that natural? Yeah. It's beautiful. Look at his hair. Look at it. Yeah, touch it. So what's the religious symbolism of the hat? Wait, so let me get this straight. You actually turn red in the sun. Like you change color. That's crazy. So, so hopefully what you got there was a little bit of background around some of the um, ridiculous things that people say to each other and what they might look like if they were reversed. Um, so, I mean, my call out to you would be um, to consider what you say and have a, have a think about it and just, just check it really to make sure that you, you don't fall foul and, uh, and make some of those uh, microaggressions. So other activities that we've done to try and help educate our organization and, uh, and, uh, and individuals is a race book club. So we bought uh, the 50 senior leaders, a range of titles, and we give them one each. We ask them to read them, pass them on throughout their organization and record their learning. And the idea was um, hopefully by doing this, we would give them a bit more knowledge about race equality that they could take into their day-to-day -day work. A really, uh, finance people will love this because it was re it was really uh, inexpensive to roll out and, uh, and quite effective in its impact. And those books are still circulating today, so fun, which was, which is great.
so there's a couple a couple of the titles there that you you, you might want to consider. We've done a lot of work around uh, trying to celebrate various festivals. So here's one um, where we we uh, linked with a local mosque. The mosque uh, gave us over a hundred food parcels to share with staff, and members of our staff network went out to deliver that to stations so uh, people could break the fast and uh, and help understand we. Um, what what Ramadan and, and what breaking of the fast was all about. So with with each food parcel became, uh, was a little note about where it had come from and a couple of things to consider. Again, quite a simple idea, but quite effective in, in raising the profile and, and also feeding our, uh, our hungry staff. So I've touched on several times already about the need to drip feed messages. Um, just look for times in the, uh, in the calendar over the year that you can try to put information out, whether that's on social media, in daily briefings, and weekly communications. Um, it helps the, the organization to gain a confidence that you really are committed to diversity and inclusion, and in this example, race equality. Those top 50 leaders that received the uh, books also had some uh, training and awareness raising from other people outside the organization. Yes, I am ADI lead for Northeast Ambulance Service, but there's all always uh, experience that you can pull in from other areas. So we got London Ambulance Service uh, ADI lead who has a much more diverse workforce and a di more diverse customer base uh, to help um, us understand their experience and to learn. And we link with John Broder, uh, who's NHS England Specialist Advisor to, um, to try and gather his experience and information as well. We, with that senior leadership forum and our staff network group and through the Race Safe Space events, we came up with a range of actions. Uh, we've agreed to complete those over the next three years. What's great about this action plan is it's not just owned by the uh, diversity and inclusion team. Each senior manager was given an action to deliver and lead on. So that was embedded across the organization. I think some of the challenges with diversity and inclusion uh, people often look to the lead to deliver any, everything, and uh, if we can get a wider group of people involved, then it helps to embed that understanding and uh, and commitment, and um, and protecting our staff. Um, so over the last year, we've seen uh, the impact of COVID hit our uh, staff network groups. So again, we've been making sure that we reach out, we complete risk assessments, we do check-ins, we've done telephone check-ins with each member of staff to see how they're feeling, if they've had a risk assessment, any concerns they've got about the COVID vaccine, and just try to dispel some of those myths. It's also been important for us to link with um, groups nationally. Um, so we've got, we're fortunate to have a national ambulance uh, BME forum. So we've made sure that we use their resources, use their experiences, link in with that organization, and we're an active part of that group. So we can bring that learning back to the trust and hopefully help to uh, use that uh, experience to be able to inform our decision-making processes and our future plans. And that's similarly around national events and activities, you know, the NHS people plans come out, uh, Prenor's been doing, uh, catch-ups every couple of uh, couple of weeks so we've been making sure that we link in with that and we keep up to date with uh, what is a fast and ever moving uh, agenda on race but also on diversity and inclusion it's also it's important we link in with our national bodies as well our professional bodies so for us it's the association of ambulance chief executives and they've made some uh, promise some campaigns and some activities um, so we're making sure that we're reaching out and supporting them and making sure that the work we do aligns with what they're trying to achieve. Just, just as important as that is the work that's going on in the integrated care system. We're only uh, part of that. Um, so you can often have a much greater impact if you link it with other NHS providers and you try to share resources, activities, uh, knowledge, experience and, and, and come together to deliver shared events. So as I touched on earlier, we had a, a recruitment event for black, Asian, minority, ethnic communities. We worked with six local NHS providers to deliver that. And as a result of that, we had a, a, a much uh, greater impact attracting over 400 people to that event. And a number of, uh, well, each organization recruited at least one person from that event uh, with some recruiting sort of five, six, five or six people. So we create a power um, by linking together.
Um, we've also got a regional um, staff network. Um, so we make sure that our staff network chairs can link in with other chairs from other NHS providers and they can support each other, learn from each other, but they've also developed their own program of events and activities support the work in the region. So that's a little bit just about what we're doing next. Um, so we're, we're only at the start of this journey. We've made great progress over the last 12 months, but we recognize there's still a huge amount of work to do. And, um, and we'll be working with our staff and regional partners to try and deliver on that. Thanks, Mark. Um, that was uh, a fantastic uh, presentation. So I'm just going to ask one question, if that's OK. Um, what's the top tip you would give to our audience? What's the one thing that they could think about doing that would have the biggest impact? I think the biggest impact for me is being um, getting managers and senior leaders on board. So how do you do that? How do you improve their knowledge, prove their understanding, get them to understand the impact of not just race equality, but diversity and inclusion. And then with the help of those senior managers, um, you, can, you can then really start to embed this across the organization. Um, Cause you, you know, one person or a small team can't really have a huge impact on diversity and inclusion. It's really about bringing the whole organization with you and you need that uh, senior commitment to be able to do that. Brilliant, thanks Mark. As I said, that was a really great presentation um, and lots of really useful um, tips and resources were included. So we'll get the slides circulated to everyone and I'm sure we'll be asking you to come back at a future event so we can uh, hone in on some of the details and, and uh, spend some more time with you if that's okay. Um, so thank you very much. We are going to move on to our next session now where we are going to talk, uh, well, David is going to talk to us about recruitment bank of panellists. Welcome, David. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. Um, over to you. Thank you, good evening, everybody. Um, just to introduce myself first. So um, I'm Chief People Officer of the NHS Foundation Trust, which is a large, um, a large trust in, in London, obviously. Um, runs three hospitals, uh, 1,000 staff. Um, and I'm here this afternoon really to sort of talk um, about uh, trying to improve the diversity of recruitment, but particularly looking at the um, discrimination that we've seen in recruitment processes or the impact of race discrimination, conscious and unconscious in recruitment processes and how, how we tackle that. Um, so I'll, I'll give a little presentation, just first a little bit more about me. So I, I've heard some of the presentations and you know, the, the, the fact that we don't always have visible leadership from minorities and different groups or people with societal differences uh, in the NHS. Um, I'm, I'm gay. I live in London uh, with my husband. He's taking the dog out for a walk so that he's not barking while I'm making this presentation. Um, and I've been in the NHS sort of since 2003. And I think, you know, uh, we've made some progress in these areas, but not nearly enough. Um, I think the um, Black Lives Matters and um, the impact of COVID that we've seen, I think really are accelerating the pace of change though, which is positive. And it's great to see organizations like the HFMA and, and people like yourselves uh, having, um, having conversations like this and, and taking an interest in, in, how we, in how we tackle the disparity that we've got in representation of people um, across the workforce um, and across the NHS. Um, so this is a little bit of the, a background to our trust. So you can see there 10,000 staff, 10,305 when that last count was taken at May. Um, and you can see actually it's, it's broadly a 50-50 split between staff who identify as black and minority ethnic um, and those that are identifying uh, as white. Um, but many of you will know and you'll have heard of the workforce race equality system metrics and that's what red um, that by measuring these, we know that we can see, and, and what I'm here to talk about this afternoon, we've got you know, less than that proportion of black staff in senior roles. So BAME staff less likely to be in, in their senior roles, less likely to be appointed, almost goes without saying, doesn't it? If we haven't got people there, it must be because they're not being appointed. Um, but more likely to be disciplined. These are the res metrics that we, that we, that we measure. Uh, less likely to get access to the training. Again, that's linked to can you get the promotion? Because if you can't get the training, you can't get the promotion. Uh, more likely to feel bullied or be bullied. Uh, and more likely, obviously, to be discriminated against as well. 
Um, and we, we've not been any different to other trusts in that. If you look at some of our measures, and actually London trusts tend to do a bit worse than the rest of the country, despite having um, that sort of greater number of black and minority ethnic staff in many cases in their workforce. So that's a, that's a little bit about us. Um, and what we've been doing is trying to work on, well, how do we change our recruitment processes just as part of a range of responses um, to uh, improving sort of inclusion and diversity across our organisation? So you were hearing from Mark that there were a range of initiatives that London Ambulance Service has taken. We've also taken, you know, a number of initiatives. We, you know, network. Indeed, it's through contacts there that I was invited to come and speak uh, at this event. Um, we've um, changed our recruit, we changed our recruitment practice, which is what I'm going to talk about this afternoon. Um, but we've also, you know, done work on tackling bullying and harassment. Uh, we've been trying to change some of our uh, approaches to sort of listening to staff. Um, we've been very much trying to promote a debate about why do we have discrimination, why do we have racism occurring in 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 in, in the NHS, and what we can do about it as a collective. And I uh, and we're also trying to work collectively across our system within our wider ICS on this. Um, so, but as part of our sort of commitment, we think fundamentally, you know, one of the things we need to do, and it goes back to some of the comments that we have enough LGBT. Um, uh, people, you know, in leadership roles, you know, within the finance function, etc. You know, actually, if the workforce and the leadership um, are representative of one another, we think that actually you will eliminate a lot of the decision making. So I think somebody uh, expressed the aspiration that, you know, hopefully we wouldn't in the future need conferences like this, focusing on poor treatment of, uh, you know, certain segments of society or segments of the workforce, um, and 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 that there's broad acceptance. Well, actually, if we have um, a broader leadership that is truly reflective of both the community that the NHS is serving, but the workforce that works in it, as those people are the decision makers, you know, who make decisions, we think those decisions will, by, of their nature, become less discriminatory. We will start to eliminate things. People will have those role models. So that's why we've really focused on this, because we think it's fundamentally what will change things in the longer term. Um, and we are trying to close that gap. So you, what the, the graph there, that's a little bit small um, on the screen that I can see now, um, but what that's showing you is effectively that blue line at the top is the proportion of BAME staff that we have in our works and the, the data um, on the previous slide, that's just at about 52% of our organization. But you can see the red line beneath um, is the number of those that are in um, senior positions in the organisation or is it in, in managerial roles, etc. And you can see that that's much less. It's it's round about 30 percent. It used to be less than 30 percent. Um, and we've been we're trying and that, you know, that in effect is the gap that we're trying to close. And we believe that once we get to proportional representation at 50 percent, um, we will be broadly, you know, we will get better decision making in the organization and we will see um you know some of the decisions that are uh, taken that might be discriminatory sort of eliminated so what have we done as i said we've set a target um that was an initial target interestingly um nhs organizations have all been given um a sort of instruction to come up with their targets for when they will achieve proportionality and at the moment nhsei is consulting on in the national contract for providers um, suggesting that we that there ought to be plans for achieving some sort of proportionality within five years. Um, I, clearly, at the pace of change we're going, that's not going to that's not going to be easily deliverable. Something else is going to have to to change. But the things that we've done so far are effectively requiring that you know we train all of our recruiting managers. So that include that's designed to ensure that they're better and fairer at the process. So that they're aware of things like unconscious bias, the unconscious biases that they may hold. They're aware of, you know, not you know, legislation around discrimination um, and that they cannot discriminate against people on grounds of, of race or age, etc. And the sorts of things that that might represent. Um, and I think, you know, I've been in many NHS organisations and actually, it, you know, it's often been difficult to sometimes get managers and people to go through their recruitment training. Um, you know, there'll be the people often at senior level who say, well, I don't need to do this. I've been recruiting all my life. Um, but we've actually sort of started to enforce that and stop people recruiting or conferring recruitment decisions if they've not gone through, got, not gone through that. The other thing, and this is, I suppose, the bigger part of the change, was that for the senior roles where we can see in our ESR data that we've got disparity, we've said that you have to have a diverse panel um, making, making the appointments. 
Um, and we plan to extend that down the organization um, more as, as we grow the numbers of people who are sort of trained to sit on those panels. And what that means is that we have a black and minority ethnic member of staff sitting in, sitting on part of the panel um, that is making the recruitment decisions. Um, uh, and we think that that helps in several ways. One, it's sort of, you know, for the candidate who's being recruited, it means that they see a panel that includes people that are like them. Um, and that we've heard from um, candidates from BME backgrounds is often reassuring. It helps people relax a little bit more. Um, it also provides for um, that, for that um, person to, you know, be able to sort of, um, uh, be able to sort of pick up on with, with panel members anything that, you know, they may interpret or not misinterpret from not understanding culture and things like that. I think it's quite a difficult job. Um, and I think one of the things that we've struggled, and I'll come on to difficulties in a moment, is, you know, is, 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 is that panel member a full member of the panel? Are they there to police the other panel members? Can they stop the process if they think it's not being fair? Um, uh, that sort of debate. But what we have found is that it has made a difference or seems to have made a difference in the numbers of times that shortlisted BAME candidates are being appointed. Um, it doesn't mean, of course, that a BAME candidate will always be appointed. Um, but one of the other interventions we've made is um, it's often cited as sort of comply or explain um, is that if we if a, a BAME member who's been shortlisted isn't appointed, there has to be a very clear set of reasons um, why the other candidate was preferred, but also what's the development that that BAME member of staff um, or applicant might need that can then be followed up, particularly if that's our own staff. So they can get, um, or if it's feedback within the organization, we can then act on that, hopefully sort of providing some support and development um, for that individual. Uh, and the thing that's made that difference there is that actually those reports have to come to the CEO. Um, I will explain that we blatantly copied this a couple of years ago from an idea that we heard of in the US Army um, and to improve their diversity in the appointment of sort of senior staff and generals. That's what they had decided to do was to a have diverse panels, but also to have this um, comply or explain uh, process that meant that senior generals you know, had to write to explain why they hadn't appointed um, shortlisted um, black candidates or uh, BAME candidates um, into posts in the American military. So we thought in the spirit of QI, quality improvement and trying things and monitoring to see if they make a difference, we would give it a go. Um, and that's how this all started. The other thing that we do, of course, is we, we sort of very carefully monitor the res data and including this and how many members of staff we've got at particular levels. And I think what that's doing is it's trying to sort of share that ownership of this agenda. This is not a HR agenda. It's got to be the whole organization's agenda. Um, and we've you know been out to explain to people why we're pursuing this. Um, and then, of course, the other thing is to support people getting ready for interviews. So we've introduced BAME mentoring and coaching programs, and we've run some sort of special sort of training and um, interview and CV support sessions as well um, aimed at those staff. But some of the things, you know, we do, we do have, there are issues with this. So one of the things is supporting the BAME member who sits on the panel. Um, you know, do they have the right to sort of stop this, making sure that they feel comfortable and confident um, to participate? Um, the other thing is actually just getting all of this sort of compliance, just, just the sheer monitoring of compliance with the process that we've set has proved quite cumbersome. So any of you who know our recruitment processes will you know that we use systems like ESR and TRAC you may have heard of and other recruitment systems. Uh, and they weren't designed for sort of monitoring this sort of process because, of course, it wasn't our process uh, up until uh, we started it. So... Uh, and of course, a lot of candidates, their ethnicity and their age and things like that are anonymized uh, at the point up to the points of um, sort of successful appointments. So there's, it's, it's proved quite difficult to sort of easily extract data and to build in our process chasers to managers to make sure that they write their reasons for making appointments or not making appointments down. Um, but we're getting there. Um, and I think, um, you know, but it did it did off to a slow start in terms of being able to monitor the data. I think the other issue, um, and it's interesting, I saw in the, the comments about the event that, um, you know, some people, some of our managers perceive this was this sort of special treatment for a group of staff. Um, uh, and was the, you know, or was it commenting on their ability as leaders and managers to make their own um, 
uh, recruitment decisions safely. And, and clearly it, it, it's not that, um, but the evidence is, is that we definitely don't have, you know, we've not been making the right decisions because we haven't got that proportionality in the workforce, despite having clearly shortlistable candidates that have worked their way up onto shortlists. So we've, um, we've had to do a bit of explaining that to people. Um, and, um, and then finally, you know, we, you know, this is not the only thing that we need to do in terms of recruitment. One of the things, and again, people have alluded to this earlier, is, you know, development stage. So our BAME colleagues getting access to the right training and development, um, you know, to, to allow or to support promotion uh, in their chosen field of um, professionalism or practice. Um, so if you're a nurse, you know, can you get on the ICU nursing course or the midwifery course that will allow you to to make the next step of progression? Or do we have discrimination in some of the decisions that are made there? Similarly, with acting up, you know, opportunities, things like that, we need to make sure we're monitoring those and offering them out um, and applying a sort of diverse approach to offering people those uh, opportunities. Uh, you, you might ask the question, is it working? We think it is. Um, and it, you know, it, it, you know, we do appear to be tracking in the right di direction. Um, we think we've noticed an increase in the number of people being uh, appointed. Um, I think the difficulty is, you know, um, I think somebody sort of put a question about this. You know, what's the target? Will we get there with proportionality, um, uh, and how quickly? Um, we're keen that we do it as quickly as possible, um, but there's also sort of some limitations in that if you have incumbents, and I'm one of those, you know, um, I'm a white male in their 50s, um, as it's stale, pale and male, I think sometimes they, they might call us, um, you know, un unless I move on, you know, that opportunity there for somebody else to come in and perhaps change that diversity of the board isn't going to be there. Um, but there are ways around that. You know, you can co-opt people, you can have people work with you, shadow you, um, act for you um, in various ways. And I think that's something that, you know, as I said, organisations need to think about as the way that they can both support people getting ready, but also um, uh, to, to sort of help change the diversity of committees and boards and things like that that we see. So what next? Um, I think, you know, you will all be aware of the national people strategy, hopefully. And there's some quite clear commitments in there to sort of move nationally to try and tackle this issue. London has just launched its own race equality strategy. Um, and most London, well, all London NHS organisations are pretty committed to that. And you've just heard the presentation from London Ambulance Service uh, about everything that they're doing. Um, but genuinely, there's, a, there's quite a strong collaborative developing in London, partly because London has some of the worst outcomes on this, um, to try and uh, how we can support the AME staff, both in terms of their career, but also their other aspects of discrimination um, that we've been hearing about and you know and, and not just concentrating on race but also the inclusion of other um, underrepresented groups or under, un, uh, under groups without sufficient voice uh, across the NHS. So I'm going to stop there because um, that's told you a bit about what we what we've done um, in the recruitment sphere uh, and I'm happy to have a, have a bit of a discussion Sandra or answer any questions that people may have. Thanks, David. Um, can I start just by picking up on the comments that you made there about other groups? So at the moment, you're clearly monitoring your performance against um, your BAME targets and RES standards. Are you planning on doing the same for other um, protected characteristics and other groups of staff? So actually, yes. And I was I was answering that, you know, most organisations have a duty to sort of um, publish their sort of um, equality data under the, the public sector equality duty annually and, and we do we do do that and we look at that and we have been getting better at looking at almost all of our data through an equality lens and the reason we focus particularly on um, the um, issue of race in sort of promotion and bullying predominantly if we took for example sexuality and looked at our workforce that actually isn't disproportionately underrepresented at senior level within the raw free, but it, we need to look at the data to make sure that that remains the same. We do have an issue, um, and uh, you know, with disability as well. We definitely need that. You know, we definitely need to promote that. The question is, is can we do that quite as easily? Um, some of my colleagues sort of suggest, you see, you, you know, disabilities can be quite hidden. Whereas race often is something that in a way isn't isn't as, as easily perhaps hidden or people make assumptions about, um, which is one of the reasons why, you know, um, on a panel, um, it feels, you know, I, we've been told it's, um, 
it's often a little bit better if the panel looks you know is diverse and therefore people can sort of recognize people like them on on the panel that they're being interviewed by just on um the question of you know what are you measuring yourself against you mentioned the makeup of your entire workforce was was what you um targeted um is that the same as the makeup of your population or should we be thinking about it in the context of the wider population yeah it, it, so actually uh, we're slightly uh, the numbers of um black and minority in the NHS for us are actually slightly higher than, than in the population. And I think the, the way the NHS is viewing this is really it ought to be the workforce that counts um, or the population, whichever is higher. Because actually, if, you're, if your workforce isn't representative of the population you're serving, well, that in itself is an issue that needs rectifying. And then if you have, a, if you have a, an organisation that's perhaps more diverse than the population, um, are you able to sort of make sure that you're representing the, the, the workforce properly? I think one thing, one word of caution in some of these statistics, of course, is that is that the way the NHS is structured now means that sometimes there are cohorts of workers that don't necessarily work directly for you as an organisation. So they might work in a shared service, they might work in a uh, in a in a contracted out function. Um, so MediRest, you know, um, some of the other commercial sort of firms that might offer portering and sort of soft FM services. And there's something about how do we as a collective make sure we're, we're properly looking at diversity and working with those partners to do that and not artificially sort of excluding sort of chunks of uh, uh, the workforce that might make the statistic look a bit different. Um, uh, and uh, so I think that's that's something to be something to some, something for each organisation to think about. But if you often it might be sort of some of those lower paid, you know, areas where we know we've got higher proportions of black and minority ethnic staff that are then, if you like, outsourced and then may not count in the statistics. And actually, arguably, your representation should be even greater if those people are brought in and counted within the workforce. Last question. Um, so how how about ensuring that what you're doing isn't just seen as tokenistic that actually having um, a member of a representative panel make a difference having the explain or comply really has an impact yeah so well, we're, we're measuring the outcome so we're trying to measure you know do does it look like the likelihood of so it, it's the it's the workforce race equality standard measure three you know the likelihood of being appointment is that changing but also this you know actually what's happening are we seeing that gap narrow between the proportion of lack of minority ethics stuff in the workforce and those that are in leadership roles and we think it is we think it is working i think what's very different is that the diff, different difficult is that there isn't all, an awful lot of benchmarking that that can be done in some of these areas you know I, some of those points I've made about sort of various parts of the workforce being outsourced mean that, you know, like for like comparisons are a little bit more difficult to perhaps come by. I think the other thing we've done is that really we've worked very closely with our black and minority ethnic staff network on some of this. So it's not just a ideas that, you know, are being um, plucked from the ether. Um, we're genuinely talking to that group about which ideas are the ones that we should take forward. And I'm very keen, actually, that we don't lose sight that this is the only intervention. I think one of the key ones we need to make is that preparedness and getting people into the right programmes. I'm very interested in starting to look through our data. And the, the trouble is, is partly often we don't have great data on this, is, the, is, is, is information about who's getting access to which training and development. Is that equitable? And how are we monitoring it to make sure that, you know, um, everybody's getting the, the, the same access to time off, um, uh, study leave, the funding for external courses, whatever it is that you need in that particular part branch of the of a profession or the workforce to get on um, with your career. Thank you, David, for um, spending some time with us this afternoon. We have all found it really useful. There are lots of questions again, but I'm afraid that, that we've run out of time. One thought that I'll leave you with that I might pick up with you offline if that's okay um someone's asked a really interesting question about if there is any plans to review the ethnicity pay gap in the same way we've considered the gender pay gap so um did you want to so respond just just quickly we we do measure that at the uh, it, within the royal free it's not a statutory obligation yet but i believe it should be um, we do do it. So the same as the gender pay gap report, at the same time, we tend to we, we look at our, the pay differentials by ethnicity. 
and we have picked out that there are there are differences. So that is again something it's it's, it's something that drives us to try and and again the answer to it is if you have proportionate representation, you should see pay being relatively proportionate between the groups as well. What drives a ethnicity pay gap is that too many of our black and minority ethnic colleagues are in lower pay band jobs because we haven't appointed enough of them to those those higher paid roles. It's great to hear that um, that, you, that you're already thinking about that. So uh, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. And I'm sure we'll see you soon. Thank you, David. Thank you, everybody. Um, so uh, moving on quickly to the next session, we are going to be joined by Henry Black, who is the Chief Finance Officer for uh, NHS North East London Commissioning Alliance, who is going to talk to us about his personal perspective of understanding white male privilege. Hi, Henry. How are you? Hi, Sandra. I'm fine. Thanks. How are you? I'm good. Thank you. Over to you. Excellent. Thank you very much. Can you, you can see me and hear me, can you? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, well, thank you very much for, for asking me to speak um, and uh, congratulations to everyone for, um, for making this event happen. It's such an important subject um, for me and one that's really important to me. Um, my name's Henry Black. I'm the, the Chief Finance Officer for North East London CCG, as Sandra has said. I'm the um, about to become, for a period of time, the Acting Accountable Officer for uh, North East London CCG as well. Um, um, I'm, an also, I'm also the, the board level exec sponsor for our uh, BME network, so I'm, I'm heavily involved in, in the kind of uh, equality and diversity agenda. Um, I've been asked today to give my own personal reflections um, so, so the talk I, I, I give today may, be, may feel slightly unusual and slightly unconventional and not necessarily what you might expect to hear from a CFO. I want to, to speak from, from the heart um, about my, my observations of, of a particular subject. So um, I want to talk about white privilege um, and in particular um, white male privilege. Um, and the specific reason I, I think it's important for, for somebody like me to come and talk um, about about this subject um, is because I, I feel like it is um, it's an imp it's important that that uh, that white men like me need to to face up to to issues that that, that we might not necessarily want to. Um, there are lots of examples of how <coughs> racial injustice and inequality affect um, people, um, and generally speaking, for people like me, people in positions of influence who are who are white men, and frankly, there are too many of us. Um, normally, our our role should be to to listen and reflect and absorb, um, but certainly I think it's also important to for for people like me to stand up and, and acknowledge our role, um, and acknowledge what uh, what being a genuine ally is all about, and what we can do to help tackle discrimination. And the first thing that we can do um, is to to acknowledge the the, the issue that the issues that that, that I believe exist. Um, so to use a bit of a tired cliche, holding up a mirror. Um, to other people who look like me um, and, and just standing up and, and, and speaking out. Um, so like I say, this might feel slightly unconventional. It might not be terribly polished. And I know uh, some of the other um, conversations that we've been having today have been much more about um, kind of specific things that organisations need to do and, and um, absolutely rightly the kind of statutory stuff and following the, the, the appropriate uh, processes. Um, and I'm absolutely not saying that that's not the right thing to do at all. But I think my brief here for the very short time I've got, I've got 15 minutes, um, is just to talk from the heart, I believe, about um, about what this this means and to be somebody who is prepared to to take a step out of my comfort zone and to to role model um, and to, to, to speak with some hopefully some authenticity. <clears throat> so. Um, white privilege as a as a concept is controversial in itself, and it's not particularly well understood. Um, it's quite an academic term, um, and lots of people um, feel that there is uh, inherent problems with the term because it kind of sounds it sounds like an accusation, and that all white people are deliberately somehow consciously using their whiteness to gain unfair advantage. And for, for lots of people, it doesn't it doesn't feel like that. Um, <clears throat> other people say that it's it's overly intellectualized uh, and it's an abstract or or that it's been hijacked by uh, extreme political groups and has been almost weaponized and used um, used against people. So, so I'm not interested in in, in, um, in academic debate, and I'm not a politician. I'm not here to, to talk about that. What I am here to do um, is just to give my own observations and my own own reflections um, and what I believe uh, to, that, that I observe on a day to day basis. 
And, and, the, and I believe that the fact that society uh, still contains um, unequal distribution of power and privilege, I think that's just a matter of fact. Uh, and I think it's the duty of people like me, so white men, as I say, in a position of authority and influence, um, to highlight the issue, to raise awareness and to be prepared to speak out about it. Um, so I should also apologise in advance if I don't necessarily always use the right phrase or the right terminology. Um, and I really recognise that I need some help with this uh, on a day to day basis. But like I say, this is my own um, my own personal ob observations. Um, and so I'm going to, to, to as I say, going to going to say what I think. <laughs> Um, so obviously, as um, as a white man, I can't speak about my own personal lived experience of, of BME issues. Although, um, I, as it happens, my son and two of my nieces are mixed race, so I have some personal insights. But what I can do, though, is is speak about my own personal experience and observations um, as a white man, um, and and help people to to possibly to understand um, what it what it feels like and and um, what what people need to. I think need to have a conversation about. So it's not necessarily surprising to me that, that sometimes white privilege is, is, is difficult to understand and grasp. It's not a tangible thing that you, that you feel or see. Um, you don't get issued with uh, a special badge that gives you special kind of uh, you know, discounts and entry to certain things. Um, and for a lot of white people, particularly now, um, the, the idea that they possess privilege can feel a bit abstract and not immediately obvious to them. Um, but for me, the best description I've, I've heard um, is that for people, any people, what, for, for, well, for white people in particular, suffering real and genuine complex challenges uh, in their day-to-day -day life, um, the color of their skin won't generally be a direct factor contributing to what makes their lives difficult. There'll be lots of other things, and you might have personal or financial difficulties uh, that you're grappling with on a day-to-day -day basis, but the colour of your skin won't, won't in and of itself contribute to either exacerbating these challenges or impeding your ability to, to overcome them. Um, so in my personal lived experience and my, my own career journey, I won't deny that I've had to work really, really hard. I'm not suggesting that because I'm a white man, I've just strolled through my career and just managed to um, just kind of doors have just opened in front of me. I've had to overcome lots of obstacles and lots of knockbacks. Uh, a lack of confidence when at an early age, a feeling of not being good enough, um, being told that you're too young or too inexperienced or whatever that might be. Um, but I can honestly say I've never personally been made to feel that the colour of my skin has held me back. And that's, that, that's the difference. Uh, and I always feel that there is just a certain base level of respect and I guess for want of a better, a better word, legitimacy that, that society just affords me as a kind of, as a default, if you like. Um, everybody encounters imposter syndrome, no, ma no matter what position you're in and no matter what, what role you, you occupy, everyone encounters imposter syndrome from time to time. Uh, but generally speaking, for white people, you've, you might feel out of place and looked down upon when you're in a boardroom for the first time, but not when you're waiting for a bus or browsing in a shop. That's never happened to me, certainly. So for me, white privilege is not about jumping the queue. Um, it's more about never having known that there was a queue in the first place. Um, it's an unconscious thing. And the point is you benefit from the absence of something. And that's why it's so difficult for people to, to, to understand. Um, but I like to kind of, um, kind of rationalize, and I've thought about this a lot in, my, in, in recent years. Um, and um, my reflection when I was at school, I love to learn about history. I love reading history books now. Um, history was my favorite subject when I was at school and I ended up doing my degree in history. So um, I'm not quite sure how I managed to become an accountant and a CFO, but there you go. Um, so when I was at school doing history, I learned about Henry VIII and uh, Sir Francis Drake and Walter Raleigh and Winston Churchill and all these famous kind of figures in, in, in history. Um, and the fact that they're all more or less without exception are all white men was never was never pointed out at, at any point as being particularly noteworthy in itself. Um, but more importantly, the reason why all of the people, influential people in history were white men was never actually explained or called out, um, be, basically because of the two greatest crimes in, in history against humanity, slavery and colonialization. So uh, not only were white men um, perpetuating that, that kind of, um, you know, th those horrors, but they were, that, that's also the reason that, that that kind of positions of influence were completely excluded from, um, from people of colour in, in history. So only 
only really Gandhi, Ma Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela are the kind of main non-white figures who are celebrated in history. And they weren't celebrated for their kind of grand achievements as part of the political establishment. They were largely um, famous for re their resistance to white oppression. So that just goes to show what, um, what non-white people have to do to get in, uh, a mention in the history books. So, so this is the kind of normalization that, that I, I grew up with and all my friends at school grew up with. So we all absorbed as young white boys and girls growing up in the 80s that all famous people in history were white and most of them were white men. Um, and our little white heads were kind of um, absorbed and processed and internalized all of these facts. And it became part of the fabric of what we would expect to see. Um, and all the portraits and statues of famous historical figures, um, you know, statues are, um, have, have recently been in the news uh, for other reasons. Um, but it's this kind of normalization and this expectation in society um, is the reason why nobody thinks it's strange when all the bosses who, who wear suits and are in charge are all white and all the cleaners and all the taxi drivers are black and nobody ever questions that. Um, and I think people should question it and I think it should stand out. And I think when you see that on a day-to-day -day basis, people should should be upset by it and they should be appalled by it. Um, so one other little kind of anecdote that people may, may well have seen over the summer, there was a, a, a news article about a barrister. Um, and for a lot of people, probably um, the idea of a barrister, the image that pops straight into your head would be a kind of middle-aged white man with long robes and a wig. But in this particular case, the barrister in question worked in a family court where robes and wigs weren't required. And she was actually uh, a mixed race woman in her 20s. She was highly educated, extremely talented, um, a, a talented young woman who should be proud of her achievements under any circumstances. Um, but the, the article was all about the fact that she'd been stopped three times in one day by different court officials, who all of whom mistook her for a defendant um, rather than somebody who actually occupied that position of being a barrister. So, I mean, I just asked, can you imagine that happening to a white man in his 40s, a man, um, you know, a man who looks like me? Can you imagine that happening, me, me walking in and someone immediately assuming that I was a defendant? So, so these are just examples that I have reflected on in my, um, in my kind of quiet moments. And, um, and I, I want all this to change. I'm conscious of the fact that I'm probably overrunning now. So as I said, I'm not going to go into great detail about what we do about this because others have talked about that. That's not to say we don't, you know, that, that, that we're not doing anything about it because um, there's lots of fantastic stuff that we're doing. And I know certainly um, the, through the BME network, I'm, I'm trying to... Um, to champion all this and I believe some of the members of my BME network are on the on the call today um, so there's lots and lots of stuff that we need to do but really this was just my opportunity as a white man to take to take the the stage and take the platform and and, and speak from the heart thank you thank you Henry we really appreciate you spending time with us this afternoon and um, being open and honest with us about what uh, it feels like as a white uh, man to have to be part of this conversation and um, one of the questions that i've got though is um why do you think it is difficult for some white people to to, to talk in the way that you just have and to, to understand it and what can we be doing to help get those colleagues on so i think that there are lots of reasons firstly um i guess people don't want to recognize that the privilege the idea of of, of uh, of, of possessing privilege feels uncomfortable to, thing to admit to. I would also say that, um, that I am um, in a very fortunate position that because of my seniority and my authority, I kind of am, am afforded a bit of leeway whereby what I say is kind of, you know, carries some, some kind of um, credibility. So I have that kind of comfort blanket, if you like. Um, and for other people who maybe aren't in a, um, such a fortunate position, you know, they would be potentially scared to um, to be quite so honest because they might be worried about the repercussions. So that's another one of the reasons why I think it's important for people like me, people in positions of authority who who have that kind of, um, you know, that, that, that legitimacy and that ability to speak out to, to do so and to start that conversation and to hopefully um, empower other people to then to then kind of continue that conversation within their own within their own circles. We heard earlier um, this afternoon from uh, Mark, uh, who, who introduced me anyway, to this concept of an ally. Um, and it was a term that you used before. And I think one of the big takeaways from your talk and the session today for me is about, you know, how do I become an ally? 
um, and, yeah. and how do we start you know, having more of those conversations? Uh, but we have run out of time. So thank you very much for uh, your time this afternoon. Uh, we all appreciate it massively. Um, so thank you very much. Thank you for having me and good to see you. Thank you. Uh, thank you all uh, for your time today. And I hope we will see you next time.